Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. It is your girl, Marcy Thomas, founder of Brown Girl Collective and Live Well Sister, where, as you can see, we love to celebrate a lot of different areas of ways in which we can live well, be it from our finances to our spiritual life to just being able to center joy in our lives. And so I am really excited for tonight's guest because she is all about bringing joy. She may not think of herself in that way, but that's how I see it. After reading her book and just hearing her interesting take on pop culture and how it impacts her life and how it impacts all of our lives. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I am coming to you from the outskirts of ATL. So if you don't mind, you can drop in the comments where you're joining from, or if this is your first time, or if you're here every week, we just are really excited to be able to bring new and exciting new people your way. So tonight's special guest, we'll be going to be talking about Wannabe, Reckonings with the Pop Culture That Shapes Me by Aisha Harris. Now, Aisha is a co-host and reporter for the hit NPR podcast, Pop Culture Happy Hour. She previously held editorial positions at Slate and the New York Times. She earned her bachelor's degree in theater from Northwestern University and her master's degree in cinema studies from NYU. And so without any further delay, let's welcome Miss Aisha to the space. Welcome, Aisha. Hi, Marcy. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, yes. I am really glad to have you here. And as I was saying NPR, I was like, hmm. I just think I'll have to talk to you about some of the people and things that you get a chance to talk to in that space, because that's a really <laughs> great, you know, place for us to get information and be introduced to different folks. So, so your book has been out for a couple of weeks. How does that feel? How's that going? <laughs> it feels really good. You know, I've, I've done a few in-person events across the country and it's been really fun to connect with people. Some, some people I knew, some people I haven't known or just strangers who have seemed to be really digging the book. Um, and so it's been really, really fun and way better than the process of actually writing the book. Wow. <laughs> well, we can get into the, let's get into that now and then we can, you know, get into the actual book itself. So yeah. this is your first book debut novel. So again, congrats on that. What was that process like for you? Um, you know, I, I will say like, I, the reason why I've always liked writing hasn't necessarily been the actual process of it, but the feeling I get afterwards, mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel as though I've climbed a mountain or I've done, or I've done mm -hmm. something, uh, you know, extraordinary because, you know, I, I think a lot of writers will tell you that it's, it's a, it's often a solitary experience. Yes. It is an experience that um, can make you question yourself in the, in the middle of it to make you wonder why am I doing this? Um, and I have to say like my editor and my agents and, and my partner, like people in my life were so supportive and I was very, very lucky to have that. Um, but it, it was also just like one of those things that it was my first time doing something like this, mm -hmm. writing something in such a long format. And while I really, really love it, uh, it, it was also, it was stressful, but. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can yeah. only imagine because previously as of course you have been an editor and things like that. So you had written maybe in smaller, you know, shorter form or maybe editing the work of others versus necessarily putting out your whole book, which is 200 and how many pages we got here? To over 260 pages. Something <laughs> like that, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> It's quite a, a quite a lot. So it's quite a feat. And I, I, even though I don't know you, I'm proud of you because oh. I know that it's not such an easy thing to do. Thank you. So, um, well, the book is a series of essays. So what made you decide to do essays, personal essays versus, say, maybe doing a memoir type book or... Yeah. It, well, I think of it as sort of part memoir and part mm -hmm. cultural criticism, because this is about my experience as a critic. Uh, well, partially about my experience just as a viewer and a consumer and reader and listener of popular culture since 
I was a small child, barely sentient, you know, um, up until when I eventually morphed into becoming someone who thinks more critically about uh, the, the art that I am covering or the art that I'm consuming. And so I felt as though essay form was kind of the, the right mode for me to work in. And I wanted it to be a nice mixture of both myself and being very vulnerable at times or very uh, revealing embarrassing tidbits about myself, mm -hmm. uh, but also sort of relating it to how we think about pop culture and how we you know, interact with it and engage with it and how it doesn't just affect us, but it also affects how we see the world because so much of the ideas and and um, you know uh, the ideas and the issues that we think about outside of pop culture are also fed through entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think most entertainment, if any of it, is merely just meant for entertainment. I think right. everything has some sort of value um, to some extent. So I wanted to really explore that and really make the case for the idea that pop culture should absolutely be taken seriously. Yeah, I would agree. And it's funny because as we were uh, chit-chatting before we came on live, I was telling you how there are certain conversations that I have with my best friend where we talk about different things in pop culture. And I mean, I don't know all of it because, you know, as I was telling you, I'm a little bit older. So there's some things that I might not tap into as much, you know, now that maybe I did when I was younger, but but I have always been a pop culture person of sorts, whether it's the movies or, you know, I was around when music videos were becoming a thing and was sitting mm -hmm. watch MTV all day, <laughs> you know, and just things like that. Or, you know, the magazines that we were reading, the movies and television that we were watching. So I am one that has always, you know, been in, in gross in it. But of course, now there's just so much. Cause you know when you when you're of the age where you came up where you had three TV stations maybe five, <laughs> yeah. you cut off at a certain point. You know mm -hmm. there, there's only so much, but now it's like millions of different places where you can get that type of content. So yes, it is something, and I applaud you for being able to tap in in so many different ways. Yeah, it's uh, we we live in a interesting time because I mean I. There, as long as I can remember, there were more than five channels. But mm -hmm. even then, there were only maybe five channels worth watching, at least right. for me. You right. know, um, <laughs> and and we didn't have so many options for music. It was you know either the radio or you buy a CD or you buy an album or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have streaming, and now mm -hmm. we have all of these. You can find most almost every song that you ever want. To hear you can find it on some streaming platform so it's it's uh it's hard to sort of especially as a critic it's it can be hard to sort of sift through everything and i've mm -hmm. just kind of had to make my peace with the fact that i'm never going to be able to see everything right um but i try to see as much as i can as as and as many different things as i can well that's good that's good well let's start with what you start the book with and that is your name and you have a very interesting story about the origin of your name and how you feel about it and all of that and you know we'll, we'll get into that but i just found that a real interesting place to start yeah, so I won't give too much of it no, away no. for this. Yeah. yeah, anybody who's watching for the first time, it's not going to be spoilers. You still need to go buy the book. Let's be clear. <laughs> but we just want to uh, give you a little bit. <laughs> yes, but what I will say is that for a very long time, I had a an idea of how my name, the origin of my name, um, and how it thought I thought it was connected to a Stevie Wonder song. Stevie Wonder's daughter, one of his daughters is named Aisha. And mm -hmm. uh, the song Isn't She Lovely is about her and about uh, and it features a lyric that includes mm -hmm. her name in it. And, um, you know, my dad used to sing it to me when I was a kid. And I used to hear Stevie all the time in my house. And I, I thought that that was like exactly where it came from. Like he heard that song and then, you know, right. that was that was it. Mm -hmm. Turns out it wasn't quite that that case uh but uh this led me kind of on a journey of thinking about how i um process my name and why i wanted that song to be the one that represented my name and it wasn't just you know thinking stevie wonder was cool but it was also this kind of 
this belief that Stevie Wonder is kind of accepted by everyone. Mm -hmm. um, he is, you know, the pinnacle. He is world class. He is both popular, you know, mass culture popular, but he's also respected by, you know, world class musicians. So he's mm -hmm. got that. And um, it, it's, I, I kind of take this journey that takes you from everything to The Lion King to Alex Haley's roots to The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, it's the first chapter that I actually wrote. It's, okay. it's the first chapter in the book and it's the first chapter I wrote for the book. Um, and I really felt like it laid the groundwork for how I wanted to explore myself and, um, and just like how we see ourselves through pop culture throughout the rest of the essays. And so I feel like it's a really good sort of introduction to what you'll get in the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. And without giving too much away, you know, it's the whole thing of having a name that some would classify as an ethnic name in some yes. cases. People may classify it as a difficult name. I don't think so, but some people will. And as I was saying to you, uh, my best friend and I were just having a conversation about that, mm -hmm. about people, about the perception of names, about um, even us a lot of times, you know, as, as Black people, what we may feel or say about a particular name, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and assigning uh, value to it or thinking. I remember hearing, you know, coming up, saying things like, oh, you want a job that it, you want the type of name that if you put in for a job that people can't tell who you are just by your name. Yes. You know, those <laughs> sorts of things. I mean, hey, my name is Marcy. So, I mean, and that is my actual name. So mm -hmm. I really, you know, some people say, well, that's a white girl name. <laughs> so if you just saw Marcy Thomas on a piece of paper, you wouldn't automatically assume. No, I, I wouldn't, you know, you um, no. But it's interesting because just recently I had someone, you know, they asked me and, and what you're supposed to do, like, how do you pronounce your name? And I told them, um, but then they went on to say, oh, and then your last name's Harris. So that's easy. And I was like, okay, so my name, my first name is difficult. Like, I <laughs> just like, uh, you know, we as we were saying before this, like we, we we have no problem being able to say Schwarzenegger or I don't know um, any number of Barishnikov. Barish, yes, Barishnikov. Uh, you know, Scorsese. Like, and yet my name and, and many other names that sound quote unquote ethnic or not white ethnic, uh, everyone kind of treats as like, you know so hard <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah yes and for everybody who's watching if you want to chime in please feel free to do so because we love to have a, a conversation here as well but i i just love the way that in the book you talk about that and how sometimes even we you know may have biases against certain things or you know say that something isn't you know it's ghetto or you know whatever words that we assign to things which is isn't true but yeah. people have there are people who have a tendency to do it and sometimes it even comes up with us and you know it's basically about not necessarily trying to do things to fit in all the time you know not looking at things from a, a, a white supremacist lens so to speak Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something that I had to really sort of do a lot of self reflection on. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's, I think it's totally normal to feel that way when you're a kid, which was kind of when that was happening. And when I was wrestling with my name, but I think at some point, hopefully, we all get to a point where we're like, Oh, this is, I internalized some things. And now I need to unpack that and do away with it. <laughs> <laughs> and not and not criticize yourself necessarily for feeling that way because, you know, white supremacist uh, powers uh, that the powers that be they are very hard to tamp down and there's no way to undo hundreds of years of that easily. Um, it's about kind of trying to chip away at it. Absolutely, absolutely. There are a lot of other cultural references that you give within that chapter. Uh, Another Bad Creation, ABC. Um, you talk about a new edition. You talk about Tony Childs, you know, yes. and, and, you know, the kind of person that she, that she was uh, in um, being on, um, on Girlfriends and kind of the attitude that someone saying, I definitely think some of us tend to over-scrutinize our people. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And there is nothing wrong with our names. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because if you think about it, at some point, every name was a quote unquote made up name. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you can just grab them out the ether and be like, oh, yeah, I think I want to call myself this yeah. or that. So, I mean, yes, there's nothing. I like that, Tammy. There is absolutely nothing wrong with our names and just being able to, you know, accept that and, and work through that and all of that. But then in the chapter, you know, once again, or in the essay, not saying too much, it's also about the stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where sort of the roots of it all comes in, because, you know, I, ta I get into a little bit about Alex Haley and sort of how he was sort of an imperfect vessel for mm -hmm. um, a lot of Black pride in the 1970s and into the, you know, into the 80s and 90s. And uh, the fact that he, in some ways, kind of created his own mythology. Um, and the question is, like, how, is this good for, for Black people or is it not so great? The fact that he did make some things up and eventually wound up referring to Roots as a faction, which I think is actually mm -hmm. kind of a, a very ingenious <laughs> way right. of describing so part it. Part fiction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, okay. Um, but I, I, I think it's really interesting because it's like, on the one hand, I understand his motivations and where he's coming from. And, you know, he specifically said he wanted, um, you know, black people to have their Pilgrim's Rock or Plymouth Rock or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I get it. Um, but at the same time, it's like, but repeating things that are not true or is sort of, it, it's its own sort of like self delusion in a way that I don't think is necessarily helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where, how that whole essay kind of unravels mm -hmm. is me sort of contending with that. And my own example of like, Haleying myself. In yeah. A way. yeah, I made up my own story. <laughs> the origin, you know, or at least the origin of my name. Yeah. So that's interesting. Then now the next essay um, gets in, it's called Blackity Black, and it really gets into some of the things that we try to determine like what's black, what isn't black. You know, a lot of that also taps into your work as a critic. Yeah. So I really wanted to address sort of what it feels like to be a black critic in these times. And I think that for me, we are currently living in this really great era of black filmmaking, black music, um, black creativity in a way that, and flourishing in a way that we never have been before because there are more resources, because there are, um, you know, there's more support, public support. People are going out to see movies about Black people. That that whole myth about there being no audience for Black movies is being, you know, constantly being put to the side right. um, and, and, and proven to be a lie. And I think that because of that, and because we have so much of it, not all of it is going to be great or even good. <laughs> And as a critic, I have to I have to address that when the art is not up to what I think should be considered a good or great piece of work. Um, and so I really wanted to sort of un untangle the the sort of feelings I get because any critic, regardless of their background, is going to, you know, receive pushback because it's criticism and Right. Frankly, everyone's a critic, you know, that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> so I'm not here to say that it, this only applies to Black critics, but this is something, you know, being a Black critic makes it even more kind of thorny and tricky mm -hmm. to sort of deal with because, you know, in my earliest years of my career, I was really focused, like hyper-focused on good representation, bad representation, mm -hmm. you know, kind of checking off these boxes of, you know, does the black person live at to <laughs> live to the end? Right. Uh, are they, a, are they an enslaved person? Are they a servant? Are they this, that, that? And look, I think those are things that are obviously worth taking note of, but I also think we've kind of moved past that to the point where we don't have to be so cut and dry and we can see the nuances and we can point out things. And we can also point out things that are created by black people that may not actually be uh, doing good, I guess, for black people in a way that they might think they, it is. Um, you know, one of the things I 
talk about in the book is Queen and Slim and the reaction to that movie and how there were a number of Black critics. I wasn't one of them. I didn't actually do a review of it at the time, but there were other Black critics, my peers, who were critical of the film and felt as though in some ways it was kind of trauma porn and and mm -hmm. and was kind of taking taking a very serious subject matter in a blunt way that doesn't really amount to much substance. Right. Um, and they got pushed back. They got criticized by other black people who were saying, you know, you're not supporting this movie. Uh, they're not gonna make more movies with black people if you all, you know, shut it down. And I've faced it too. I faced it uh, when I was negative about King Richard. Mm -hmm. um, I faced it just recently last month. Um, when I wrote a negative review for NPR, The Little Mermaid. Mm. And, you know, it's, I don't think it's a good movie. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> seen I, it yet. Cause somebody asked me that the other day, have you seen it yet? And I'm like, no, I haven't. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with it. But I also think like the fact that Halle Bailey is a black Disney princess is not enough for me to say that this is like, it's not something I'd recommend. The only thing really black about it is the fact that she's black. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not really, it's not like they incorporate any black culture into this story. Um, and on top of it, it's just like in many ways a shot for shot remake of the original. Mm -hmm. So there's no real creative, you know, newness that's happening. And I had people who were very upset with me and and concerned yet again that you know Disney's Somebody's not going to make another movie. Somebody's <laughs> clapping for you, so not everybody. Thank you. I don't, well, the, the other the other crazy thing is that my review came out a few days before the movie oh, aired, okay. so these people had not even seen it. Yet. Okay. Um, so once once the movie did premiere, I kind of I didn't hear anything. It was silence. Mm. I was like, hmm. <laughs> "What did I tell you?" Mm. Uh, and look, I don't. I'm glad that there are little black girls who enjoyed it. I don't. I don't want to take that away from them at right. all. Uh, but I also think like I want better for mm. <laughs> for black children and for us. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that we have to question the kinds of representations that we applaud and that we you know, go hard for it because at the end of the day, Disney is a major corporation. Right. Uh, you know, they're they're not gonna be hurting from my little review, negative review. Um, I'm not gonna keep them from making another movie with a black person. That's just not right. the way it works. Um, so yeah, that's, <laughs> I yeah. feel very strongly about this as you can tell. <laughs> oh yeah, and I mean, it makes sense because you don't have to love everything. And as a matter of fact, you mentioned Queen and Slim. I still haven't seen that because I heard and read a lot of the bad reviews. And yeah. then I want to say my mom went to see it. There were people, not just the reviews, but also people that I knew that went to see it. They were kind of like, eh. so I, I still to this day haven't seen it. So, <laughs> so yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, you're, like, you're not missing anything, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but it's just true. And I mean, I, I'm going to hate to say it, but I'm going to have to say it because I live in Atlanta, which is the home of Mr. Perry. Ah. And, you know, there is a lot of back and forth about, you know, him and his art as well. And it's what I always say about him and specifically, I cannot deny or knock his hustle and grind that i cannot yeah. but am i a am i a person that watches everything that he creates no i'm not yeah no i i i don't get too much into tyler perry in the book but i right. <laughs> i do think he's such an interesting conundrum because on the one hand like you said he really does seem he seems to be like behind this like behind the scenes and overall good dude, except like he doesn't pay writers or like- <laughs> he Yeah, he have is a writer. writer. <laughs> okay, I'll, okay, the person that I saw the movie in the storyline was cringy and stereotypical. Were you talking about Queen, Queen and Slim? I assume probably Queen Probably so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, he doesn't pay writers because it's funny, my best friend and I, I said, we have a lot of these conversations. We were talking about that the other day because she was watching one of his shows and she's like, you know, some are better than the others, you know, whatever. And she's like, well, it just seems like he needs to get more writers. I'm like, more writers? He is the writer. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm just saying. But yeah, it's he he definitely he definitely is a very interesting figure and uh 
I'm just glad that we no longer live in a world where our only options for ma most mainstream movies were either Tyler Perry or Spike Lee. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I love Spike. I mean, Spike has his his things, but I absolutely like go hard for Spike Lee and many mm -hmm. of his movies and, and his, you know, all that he's done for black cinema and cinema in general. Um, <clears throat> but I do remember a time where it was like, Tyler Perry, Spike Lee, those are the only options. Mm -hmm, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Or the, the main options. And, and right, like yep. and with some John Singleton thrown in. With some John Singleton and some F. Gary Gray here and there, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's <laughs> now, now Tyler Perry no longer grates on me as much because he's just, you know, he's doing his own thing and his audience loves him. And then I can just go and watch some Issa Rae or I can go and watch some Ava DuVernay or whatever, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one of the things I found interesting just in your bio that you actually went to school for like theater and cinema studies. So you're not just coming at this as someone who, you know, it's just like, like me, I just be sitting there like, mm, I'm judging you. <laughs> <laughs> But in your case, you actually have studied certain things. So you have a, a different and, you know, a more expanded take on, you know, I guess what makes, quote unquote, good art versus what maybe doesn't, you know, how to tell a story, how to craft a story, those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, for a while, I thought I was going to be, you know, a, an actor, a performer. Um, and that's why I have a degree in theater. Um, but somewhere along the line, I realized... I didn't want to be a starving artist. Mm. It wasn't, it wasn't the, I didn't have the sort of uh, the hard shell that you kind of need to face rejection on a regular basis and auditions mm. and whatnot. And I loved movies. I loved TV in many ways. That was sort of how I learned about the world. And when I realized, when I started reading critics and writers who were writing really thoughtfully about film and TV, and I realized it could be a profession. Um, that was sort of the pivot moment in, in undergrad, where I was like, okay, I think this is this is a good backup plan if the theater thing doesn't work out. And mm -hmm. luckily, it, it turned out to be a good backup plan. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I've really been like a lot of my favorite writers, including Bell Hooks, who's mentioned a few times in the mm -hmm. book, um, Toni Morrison. Uh, James Baldwin, Rob, Roger Ebert, like all of these different critics um, who wrote really thoughtfully about film and TV, I kind of try to take from them and, and admire their sort of thoughtfulness and, and often em empathy and just the way they see the world. Because I feel like, especially to read any of them, mm -hmm. is to sort of understand, at least in part, what that time period was like of whatever they were talking about. Um, and I think that's one of the values of criticism is mm -hmm. that, you know, if you read reviews of any show or movie or book, um, contemporary reviews from when those things were originally released, it's such a fascinating way to like see how it was received and see how maybe things have changed since it was received. And um, yeah, I just like being able to really nerd out. <laughs> In oh, that way. I, I get it. I, yeah. I definitely understand because it's funny, just real, real quick, because even though you do talk a lot about pop culture from, you know, things that black people do, you talk about, you know, gen general population culture as well. It's funny. Just yesterday uh, I was talking to my um, once again, my best friend, we were talking about musicals for example, and she was saying how she always hated musicals, but now as she's getting a little older, she thinks maybe it was, I just didn't like Grease. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, well, and I, see, I loved Grease. But so then, did I. Yeah, but I, I had to give her the context and there, but there were things that she didn't really remember. I'm like, cause you know, Grease came out, we had Happy Days, we had Laverne and Shirley. There was a yeah. show on called Sha Na Na, cause actually the singing group that's in Grease is Sha Na Na. And yeah. the, and all yeah. of that. And she was like, I don't remember any of that. And I'm like, yeah. I said, now, mind you, it wasn't no Negroes in <laughs> None. None to be seen, except Shana Na. Yeah, I except think. the one guy in Shana Na. And I think there might have been one guy on Happy Days at one point in time. Yeah. But other than that, so I mean, yes, there were none of us. So it wasn't a thing of representation. 
but, but there I is think, the, but there is the Wiz. There's Dream Girls. Right, you know. right. As a matter of fact, here in Atlanta, both of those things are are currently in theater, and I went and saw both of them over the weekend. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, but it's just at that time, you know, it was this whole thing of the '50s and all of that, and then you take something from the '50s and you put you know, Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta, who were real popular then. So yeah, it made for a great movie then <laughs> at that time. But that's yeah. just, you know, the culture that we were in. But as you mentioned, you know, Dream Girls and, you know, The Wiz and things like that, that have stood the test of time. Because as I said, I, I just saw productions here in Atlanta over the weekend. So yeah. Yeah. so that that's just something just to think about the culture and how it continues you know, to, to ev but also evolve because the fact that people are still, you know, doing uh, re recreations of those classic things. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because that taps into something else you talk about in the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is, the, this is IP that never ends. Yes, intellectual so, property. <laughs> yes, that never ends. So the, the whole thing of people having a thought or an idea and just playing the same thought and idea over and over and over again. So you have a lot of different takes on that. Yeah, it's too much. That's basically like the too long didn't read version. But like, I, I wanted to sort of tap into this moment that we're having. And I think a lot of people that I've talked to have this sort of fatigue with how everything from our past is being sort of regurgitated and resurrected in like a slightly different form. And so we've already talked about The Little Mermaid, but it's not just that. It's obviously, you know, Bel Air, we've got, you know, the gritty-ish <laughs> or like more real uh, reboot of Fresh Prince of Bel Air. They apparently are redoing Frasier, except the only one coming back from the original series is Frasier and oh, wow. no one else. Uh, and, and just, you know, it's, I, I think that it, it spells a lot of concern and doom for me in terms of original ideas. And mm -hmm. obviously nothing is wholly original. Everything comes, everything is being inspired by something else. Right. But it's, and, and you know, there have always been revivals of Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. There have always been Broadway shows that became movies. And, you know, that, that's, that's been, that's normal, but I think right. we've reached a point where it's gotten kind of out of control. <laughs> right. To the point where, you know, again, Disney just announced that they are going to be remaking Moana. Moana mm -hmm. came out seven years ago. And so why do you need to remake it already? I Exactly. You know, the, the kids who saw it have probably not even graduated from high school yet. And yet <laughs> we're already... <laughs> return to this well um and, and it's so soon that also apparently the rock is reprising his role as, oh wow as maui so it's just kind of exhausting and in the essay i kind of talk about the 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 outliers like the things that sometimes are good and when it comes to remakes and reboots and that but mostly how it feels as though as a culture we are have a very hard time accepting the end of things mm -hmm. and accepting that things uh, maybe should end and should end on their own accord. And uh, it, it, I don't know, maybe it's just like these, this existential crisis that we're having. I feel like during the pandemic, the, the announcements of things were, that were being remade were kind of ratcheted up because mm. at, for a little while we didn't really have anything new. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, 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 people weren't really making things for a while. So yeah. Right. So it, I, it, that one is, was, that essay was fun to write in part because I just needed to get a lot of stuff off of my chest. And be yeah, I mean, it's yeah, so true. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, just the read, because uh, what else is, uh, I hear they're redoing, um, well, maybe a live action version of The Princess and the Frog. All I can say yes. is that yeah. the princess just needs to be a princess more than she is a frog. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> I, thank you. Yes. <laughs> You know, so yeah. yeah, that's coming back and all of that. But there are two things. Uh, one you talk about in the book and one that I don't really, I don't think you mentioned it in terms of reboots, remakes, prequels, sequels, all that kind of stuff. One of them just came back last week for second season and just like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
which is the, the reboot or the, yeah, I'll call it a reboot of Sex in the City. Yeah, it's uh, pretty bad, but I'm still watching it. I think like a lot of people, I'm hate watching it. Uh, just because <laughs> I've had such a long, uh, I have such an investment in the show at this point that, I, and, and I feel as though if I don't watch it, I'm missing out on something. But it's mm -hmm. really not bad, or it's really not good. Um, mm -hmm. My biggest problem with that was the fact that they seem to be trying to correct for all of the sins of the previous, the original version mm -hmm. of it by, you know, adding their diversity girlfriends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, the this only- is more than one. <laughs> I know, there's like, yes, but- <laughs> Only one of them actually really seems to fit into this the storylines at all. I think Seema, mm -hmm. um, Carrie's friend, she's the only one who like I can actually see Carrie like I can actually see Carrie be, being friends with her. But mm -hmm. Miranda and her professor, who she initially thought was a student and didn't, <laughs> right? Like, you know all of those things, and then you know it's it just seems like diversity for diversity's sake, and mm -hmm. um, I don't want that. I don't. I think that's one of the least, least interesting ways to approach art and filmmaking. Um, and it just feels hollow in many ways. And yet I'm still watching it. Are you watching it? I have been watching it, but I didn't really watch the original. The only time oh. I saw the original, and you kind of talked about it here, it was like the reruns. Because yes. back then we didn't have HBO. I didn't have HBO. I mean, I, I was never grown, but I was yeah. not paying for HBO <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we have a good question. How do you think the diversity should be approached? Or what from a from a filmmaking cinematop, you know, and the second part of that, or should it or should diversity be approached? Well, I mean, in the case of and just like that, I don't think the show needed to exist. I think that mm -hmm. Sex in the City is a product of its time. And I've watched it many, many times, and I've, you know. Definitely, there are some definitely some cringy moments throughout that entire series, but I also think that's just what it is, and we have to let it be what it was. Um, I think that for me, for the most part, I think that when we are talking about reboots and sequels, oftentimes there's just this uh, this ex ex expectation that you're just going to slap on, you know, some diversity here and there, and that's kind of what that feels like i think mm -hmm. a great example of that not being the case is spider-verse where mm -hmm. you are taking something that is familiar a familiar property but you are wholly imbuing it with this very very specific cultural uh world of an afro-latino kid um and it feels yeah disingenuous is a great word for it um and I love the way that they've done that with Spider First. Like, if you're gonna do a, do approach anything like that, I think that's the way to do it. Um, so for me, it's like it's being intentional about it, and also not feeling as though you have like not making it seem as though you're just correcting. Mm. You know, you're just kind of, oops, sorry about that. Mm. <laughs> Let's like, and I, I think yeah, and I think like something like Spider Man has that doesn't quite have the same burden that and just like that does because it's a different spider. It's like completely different. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like the, you know, Toby Maguire's, I mean, granted, they're they're still out there, but like you don't have these other characters like from the past coming in and sort of reprising the roles and then saying like, oh, all of a sudden we're gonna, you know, have a black friend. <laughs> it's it's, right. it's, it's kind of right. different. It's kind of different. So right. yeah, definitely just being intentional about it and also being not just, you know, slap. Again, it's the same thing with The Little Mermaid where it's like, she's black, but then, okay, what else? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, like, are we gonna incorporate any like Mami Wata, like any like right. yes. African, like yes. African water spirits and that like- Yes. No. That is true. Well, that's <laughs> a whole different conversation. I'm yeah. like, yes, girl, that is a whole different conversation. But yeah, they, they, don't, they don't wanna do that. Yes. <laughs> No. But the other one I wanted to bring up that in terms of moving the story forward, what did you think about um, the Best Man series going from one movie, two movies, and then, then a, a limited series? Uh, I think it could have been, and I think if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, but when I read this, I believe 
that they, it was initially intended to be a movie, like a third movie. Mm. And I could feel that while watching it because it felt like there was a lot of filler. (laughs) And it also felt like the first two episodes itself could have been, when they're on that vacation, could have been that. At the same time, I, it was like kind of comforting to see them all back together. Um, there were definitely, you know, some storylines that, again, with this idea of approaching diversity with the, the one of the children who I think was coming out as queer or mm-hmm. questioning their gender identity. Um, it, it could have been handled worse. I don't think it was necessarily like groundbreaking by any means, right. but I think, you know, it didn't feel as cringy as it could have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah, it, it, it was like, you know, good for you. It's nice to see you all back together and you don't even look, you don't look, none of them looked older. <laughs> like, because it doesn't crack. I'm just no, saying. No, no. I mean, they all looked good. So I'm just like, all right, good for you. <laughs> you know, the, what's his name? Uh, the, who's the lead actor? Um, why am I blanking on his name? Um, Morris Chestnut? No, Tay no. Diggs. Tay Diggs. Like, Tay Diggs, his character is still Still a mess, yeah. but still know. a mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He just puts that smile, that chocolate smile on you, and you can't, you know. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we do have another question, um, and then we can move on. Do you think that the way Hollywood deals with black talents contributes to the thrown together diversity? Mm, I mean, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm, I don't want to put words in this person's mouth, but like, I guess if we're talking about how Hollywood often sort of likes to ghettoize in some ways black art and black performers and say like, oh, this is a black movie because there's like, you know, more than two black people in it or whatever. Um, or the way it tokenizes and says, right. like, okay, we've got, okay. You, you know, we've got our one black character here, you know, and then we have our one gay character and blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, I definitely think it's all integrated. It's all, um, it's a ecosystem and it's all mm-hmm. feeding, feeding the same beast. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in a way, sometimes I can't blame the performers for, right. you know, taking these jobs. Yeah, you, they, you, they need work. Um, and I do think, you know, we definitely need even more. <laughs> we're in the middle of a writer's strike, but like right. we do need more, you know, black and brown writers in the in the in the writers' rooms. Um, but I think it's a lot of factors that are contributing to it. Um, but the fact that these studios at least feel the need to pay lip service to diversity is it's not great, but it's mm-hmm. better than we were at like mm-hmm. 10, 15 years ago when right. there were when there wasn't really much, especially in TV. Um, mm-hmm. That fallow period between like the end of UPN and WB turning into uh, C- CW. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, well, there was a season we had a whole lot of black shows and then it, not too many, which is, you know, where your, um, I'm not even going to say BET so much because, no. Um, <laughs> but, you know, TV One and some, and some of these others and just the whole fact of streaming. Yeah, it's really helped in that regard to have more stories told, and I said I was gonna be done with it. But one show, and you know, you well, I'm not gonna say correct me because I have my own opinion. But I liked the way that the diversity was handled on This Is Us. So I only made it through like one season of This Is Us. Yeah, because it was like <laughs> every week. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't really my thing. So I don't even, yeah. I watched it the first season when it was on and I don't actually remember. I mean, look, I watched it mostly because I was like Sterling K. Brown. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I can't, I wish I could speak to that more. But, yeah, but yeah. I just, from my perspective of watching it, I felt like, yes, it was, you know, this white family that had this black child in the family, but I felt like they didn't shy away from real issues when things were happening that even people in the family were acting out or, you know, not being sensitive. I, but I do know they had black people in the writer's room. So I'm sure yeah. that was a big part in that, that they wanted to make sure that the stories felt real versus 
you know, something that just feels totally out there. So. Well, we, we've come a long way since uh, Different Strokes and uh, mm. what was that show with Emmanuel Lewis? Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> no, that was Different Strokes. <laughs> no, no, that was, Emmanuel Lewis was on. Uh, oh, 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 I can't think of the name of it. Anybody, if y'all remember the show with Emmanuel Lewis, I can't Web think of Webster, Webster. Webster, yeah, yes. Webster. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, somebody got it, Webster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was Gary Coleman on Different Strokes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it made a big difference. So moving on from that, um, you also, we kind of touched on it a little bit about, you know, being the token, the Black friend. And you have a, a chapter where you talk about Ebony and Ivory, how a lot of times there is a, a trope or certain tropes that get put into pop culture where there is like the one Black friend mm -hmm. that shows up in, in a space. Yeah. So I grew up in suburban Connecticut in the 90s, elementary school, very few black people. There it was a school of maybe 600 kids total public school. <clears throat> and I don't know, maybe 10 black people in the whole school. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was definitely the black friend uh, in real life. And you know, I wanted to sort of use, we were talking earlier about sort of deciding between memoir and, and, and critical, cult, like cultural criticism. And, and this one is one where I really kind of divide my time between talking about how, what it was like for me to grow up as a white kid or a black kid in mostly white spaces, um, especially during the rise of the Spice Girls, which is partially why the book is called Wannabe, um, mm -hmm. and being the one who yeah, <laughs> still still up, still love it. Um, <laughs> but you know, being the one who has to play scary because I'm the only black person, um, and I wanted to sort of trace the evolution of the black friend in pop culture. So I go as far back as Huck Finn and the character of Jim, the enslaved person that sort of, I guess, befriends Huckman. As I say in, in the book, like oftentimes these friendships on screen of like black and white friends are the products of white imagination. Right. Uh, so so <laughs> there, there might be a friendship according to the, you know, the white narrator, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's how it would actually play out in real life. Mm -hmm. So there's that. I also talk about imitation of life the specifically the Douglas Sirk version, the 1959 version. Okay, yeah, um, which I love that movie. Though. I love that movie too. <laughs> um, I feel like every like there's so many black women who love it. My my mother, my grandmother. It's yeah, we lots of people love that movie. Um, but then also, you know, there's a that there's that period where we have black people playing the friends, but they're often also a servant or a slave or an enslaved person. Um, and then we move to the 80s and 90s where you start to see a little bit of progress in terms of not necessarily seeing Black people having to play those roles, but they're still playing the same character emotionally speaking. So they are, they're the friend, but they are also the, per the sidekick. They are the person who is, you know, uh, offering a shoulder to cry on or giving advice and like, you know, barely anything about who they are outside mm -hmm. of that friendship. And I wanted to sort of look at how how race is often not even brought up in those contexts and how it was very rarely brought up in my context of, you know, when I was in real life uh, experiencing these things. And then how things have changed a little bit in the last like five or six years where we're seeing somewhat more subversive examples of the Black friend, um, including uh, Zola, the movie from a few years ago, which I... Oh yeah, Benson, Designing Women. Yes, mm -hmm. I don't mention him, but um, I do mention uh, from the 90s and not the 80s so much, but from the 90s, I mentioned, of course, uh, uh, Dion from Clueless. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I specifically mentioned Gabrielle Union's character and She's All That, uh, and also Molly and Showgirls. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Zoli, Zola is like a really fascinating uh, depiction, I think, of the Black friend because the Black character is a protagonist in her right. own story. But then she has this white woman that she meets and they become friends, sort of. But mm -hmm. it's very weird because this white woman is performative in many ways in a sort of Black scent and all these other things. And mm -hmm. I think it's really saying some interesting things about what Black friendship can really, Black-white friendship can really look like, especially in the present tense. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's just interesting to see that. But yeah, because you and you touch on the point that a lot of times they, they are just a sidekick. They don't get a real full, you know, realized story in many cases. Even though thinking about designing women and thinking about Anthony from Designing Women, he was dating Cheryl Lee Ralph. I can't remember if he married her or not, but now. Oh, yeah, really? Shirley R Ralph was the woman that he wound up with. Yeah, oh. sure was. It, you know, it's funny the things that come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Trivia, but yeah, Shirley Ralph um, played the woman that he wound up with in there. But yeah, a lot of times, just like on the sidekick, you know, the one that's coming with all the wisdom, you know, all of that. The sass. And, yeah. yeah, the sass. You oh, Kerry Washington and Save the Last Dance. I yes, to talk about. yes. Yeah, yeah you yeah. mentioned that as well. But, you know, um, just the fact that it, 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 they are these tropes. Yeah. And it's things that people still look to put us in, you know, we're in a box. You know, you mentioned Lizzo. People want to put Lizzo in a certain box, mm -hmm. you know, just because of what she looks like or, or the type of music that she creates, you know, just things like that, that it's like we aren't always given the opportunity in pop culture to be uh, fully fleshed out human characters, you know, with ups and downs and flaws and, you know, and families and real lives and all these sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, um, <clears throat> it's something that we still definitely come up against and I still see, you know, the black friend <laughs> Mm -hmm. pop up all the time. I thought that was going to be Jessica Williams' character in that new show, um, Shrinking on Apple, because she kind of starts off like that. She's sort of a colleague of the Jason Segel character and the Harrison Ford character in this uh, therapist's office. Um, but she, eventually we do learn more about her. So I was, as I watched, continued watching the show, I was like, okay, she's, she's a little more established now. She's not just like here to crack jokes and be sassy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we sassy. <laughs> like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but um, a couple things. Actually, believe it or not, we're almost at the end of time. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's, fly it's flying by. It is flying by. <laughs> but um, there are a couple of pieces because parts of it, and well, at least from my reading of it, kind of tie together. You know, um, um, I'm the cool girl. Just talk. I'm a cool girl. Just talking about being a woman and you know coming into your womanhood and making decisions about how you're going to live your life not necessarily what people think it should be and then about the procreation expectation to me there are pieces of that that kind of go together just yeah. make the decisions for your own life and how you want to live it. So in the few minutes that we have, you know, just briefly, just a little bit about what those are about. Because to me, those felt a little more personal. Yeah, the the cool girl one is really about how I first thought about power and what power can look like. And through pop culture representations, I thought of it as something that trended more masculine and more um and and masculine in you know very you know binary ways but that's what i believed in so looking at characters like sam malone from cheers or um samantha jones from sex and the city uh and especially nola darling from she's gotta have it oh, how <laughs> you know there's this this idea that your sexuality can be tied up in your power and you acting more like a man um and again i use all of this in quotes of acting like a man but um, and how I had to really, this is another essay where I'm sort of unpacking my internal, in this case, like my internal misogyny and, um, how I came to really do away with that idea of what power can look like and, and how masculinity is not something necessarily, at least in the most traditional sense is not something that we should actually be aspiring to as women or, or, or you know, it's, it's kind of a trap <laughs> in the same way that like aspiring to whiteness is a trap. Like it's limiting and it doesn't help us. And it also leads us to treat other people maybe not so well. Um, so that was, that was kind of the, the, the gist of that essay. But then the other essay, um, the procreation expectation is about me and my desire, decision not to have kids, um, but more so about how I think pop culture has really, in the past, been really uh, intent on 
creating and helping to uh, uh, farm out the expectation that everyone wants kids or will eventually have kids. And so anytime you see a movie or TV show with 20, 30, 20 or 30 somethings, eventually someone's going to get pregnant. Someone's going to have a child or adopt a child. Um, mm -hmm. It happened on 30 Rock. It happened on uh, Insecure. It happened on Girls. And uh, how I think now we've kind of moved, there's a little bit more representation within popular culture today that questions whether parenting is actually worth it. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, doesn't necessarily say that no one should be parents, but it definitely, for me at least, sort of reinforces my decision <laughs> to not have kids and how um, it's okay for par some parents to say that they regret what having kids because we all have regret we all face it and one of the th like this is one of the few things if maybe the only thing that you do that you can't really take back um or at least you can't take back without facing an, a large amount of stigma right. um and so being able to talk about certain shows and tv show and movies like catastrophe um the tv series or um the movie the lost daughter that really wrestles with like what does it mean to be a parent and what does it mean to not necessarily like being a parent mm -hmm. um i think it was really kind of important to sort of look at parenting and pop culture in a different way from the perspective of someone who isn't a parent but who has been the child of parents and mm -hmm. how that's affected me in, in certain mm -hmm. ways mm -hmm. Well, that's that's good. We have had like well, this last yeah, parenting is hard. There's no handbook. Absolutely, I know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and it, it definitely. And the reality of it is, I mean, I would say probably there's probably more children that aren't planned than there are that actually are. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I... it's like yeah, it, it's it's a thing that people oftentimes get thrust into. So I mean, there is power. And being able, you know, back to the whole thing of having power, <laughs> there is power in being able to make a decision and the decision that you feel is right for you. And, you know, I, I love that not to feel like whether it's society or pop culture or family or whoever can, you know, tell you how you're supposed to live your life, whether it's the way that you choose to date, mate, relate, love, you know whether or not you choose to be a parent, those are all things that, and I do think nowadays culture has gotten better because, you know, you because you're a student of culture, you know, you go way back, you know, 50s, 60s, you know, early, you know, certain things, you know, it was definitive that this is what it was supposed to be, you know, but not so much. Because I'm thinking Three's Company, that was like one of the first time where we had like a guy and he was, you know, sharing roommates with two girls. They weren't, you know, they weren't sleeping together or anything like they were just roommates and stuff like that. But when you started to see stuff that looked a little different and I can remember my parents did not want me watching Three's Company. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't allowed reason. to watch it either. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to watch, like when it was on reruns on Nick at Night, like that was the one show that they were like, yeah, you can't watch this. I was like, okay. My, my mom was watching, <laughs> just so you know, I had a little black and white TV in my room. I was watching it. Yeah, <laughs> I was watching it. She's probably going to whoop me. But yeah, Jack Tripper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but that was one, I mean, just in my memory, that was one of the first time you saw something. It looks a little bit different from the traditional, you know, ways that you see people, you know, just, you know, living together um, as single people, just really just sharing a space, you know, that what, that it was like a male with two females sort of thing. So yeah. <laughs> So that's just interesting just to think about that and how things have changed and evolved quite so much. Well, Aisha, we didn't hit on everyone because I knew that we couldn't. Plus, we want people to read it. Yes. So once again, grab a copy of Wannabe because Aisha does a really good job of, you know, telling her story and, you know, and talking about pop culture. You know, there are some, you know, references to people that we know, people that we may not know as well, but it's, I just thought it was really well put together. And it's not a situation where it's just your opinion about everything necessarily, but there are, you know, other voices and other ideas that she brings in, even in the telling of her own story through essays. So, I appreciate it. Now, is there anything I didn't bring up that you want to make sure people know? 
No, I, I don't think so. Um, I do have uh, an event coming up. It's not till August, but uh, I have an event coming up in August at the Jacob Burns Film Center. Uh, and I, you know, I will post it on my website and whatnot, but we're doing a screening actually of Save the Last Dance okay. followed by a and a with me. So I will be there in New York. And if you are interested, you should definitely get tickets. All right. And what about your show, Pop Culture Happy Hour? Yes, you can find me at NPR on Pop Culture Happy Hour. Uh, you know, I'm not on every episode. We have four co-hosts, but mm -hmm. uh I am there. You can hear me talking about Little Mermaid. You can hear me talking about The Blackening, the, the great horror movie spoof that came out earlier this month. Um, yeah, check it out. It's All fun right, job. I'm going to put that up just to make everybody make sure they get the name right. It is, one second, it's Pop Culture Happy Hour. Yes. All right. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you because you know, as I mentioned, I am a lover of culture. There are things that I don't know just because, as I was telling you, like we were talking about before we came on, uh, like the BET Awards, for example. Once upon a time, I would have been watching the BET Awards and same, I would have known same. who everybody was. I was just looking at pictures and I'm like, who are these half-naked people? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who these people are, you know, and things like that. But, you know, in general, I do like to you know, keep up with culture and kind of who's who and what's what and things like that. So, so yes, we have someone saying they'll definitely check you out. So, yes, hey. please do that. You know, support Aisha and all of the wonderful things that she is doing. Now, this is a question I hate to ask, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it because I know that oftentimes when a writer has written one book and they're in the promotion <laughs> of that book, they're already working on something else. <laughs> is that the case with you, or you know, is there anything else we can be on the lookout for in the months and you know, year ahead? I am just going to be recovering. Uh, you know, at some point, I might write another book, or I might work on some other, you know, audio projects. Since uh, might even try some different avenues of writing, perhaps. Um, Maybe screenwriting. We'll see. You know, uh, that was in my that was in the back of my <laughs> head. I was like, well, since she know she would probably be a good screenwriter. I would hope so, but then it's like you turn from being a critic to then having people judge your <laughs> your art, and it's like, ah. Well, they're, ju they're judging your criticism anyway. So. It's that's true. That's true. Um, but yeah, no, I'm as of right now, just like look for me at Pop Your Happy Hour, and I will, yeah, just be basking in having written this book and people enjoying it and all the things. All right. Well, sounds good. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm going to let you stick with me. Normally I take, you know, the guests off screen and, you know, give some announcements and stuff, but quite honestly, I don't have an announcement for today um, regarding next week's show. I'm probably going to take the night off, but if I don't, <laughs> you know, with next week being a holiday, if I decide not to take the night off, it will be something special because actually next week is July the 5th, July the 6th, the following day is going to be Brown Girl Collector's 14th birthday. Yay! Happy birthday. <laughs> Yes. So, you know, you may see something special for that. Should I decide not to take the night off? I haven't quite made up my mind yet. But yes, going into 14 years of Brown Girl Collective and really looking to do a lot of new things and, you know, continue to come with you with wonderful content in the year and years ahead. So I just wanted to mention that. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's my second birthday. What sign is what sign is that? I don't know. Astrological sign? I'm not sure. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a Libra by birth, but I'm not sure what um, what the astrological sign is for Brown Girl Collective. But yes, I'm going to be celebrating that birthday on next week. So everyone, thank you so much for being with us. Please continue to share out the book. Go, you know, listen to Pop Culture Happy Hour. Follow Aisha on all of her platforms and, you know, just continue to support this young lady who's doing great things. So, all right. Well, Aisha, don't hang up, but I'm going to say good night to everyone else. And I look forward to seeing you all again within the either next week or the following. I'll let you know for sure which one it's going to be. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye bye.